stress strain curves allow engineers to be able to predict how much a material, specifically generally metal, will extend as we apply some kind of tension to this uh, object. And so what I'm going to do in this video is work through an example in which we are going to use stress strain curves and specifically the modulus of elasticity in order to determine how much a metal rod will extend as we apply a known force on either side of this rod. And so the very first thing to understand when you're working with stress strain curves are the basic definitions. And in engineering, we define something called stress, denoted by the Greek letter sigma, as equivalent to a force per area. And you will note how force per area has the same dimensions as pressure, which we call pascals. And so this sigma letter denotes stress. And so if you had a lab uh, and you wanted to determine or apply a stress to a metal rod, typically the way you do it is you put it into this device where you clamp down on either side of the rod and then you can put weights uh, down on the rod uh, like this and it's going to begin to apply some kind of force onto this object. Now the next important quantity we're going to be working with is denoted by the Greek letter epsilon and this is telling us strain. And strain is uh, defined to be the change in length of your material divided by the initial length of that material. And so in this example, our rod would have some initial length of L, and as we apply more load to it, it would extend. And I'm ex exaggerating this a little bit, but the point is it's going to extend slightly by a delta L amount as we apply more weight onto this rod. And so this term is called strain. And so strain goes on the x-axis of your stress strain curve. And uh, the next thing we're going to be looking at with our stress strain curves is the different regions that we see. And so the very first thing to note here is how we have a linear region initially. And this linear region has a point, a, a maximum value beyond which it is no longer linear. And this is called the elastic limit. And so what the elastic limit is referring to is that as you're applying stress onto the metal rod, you can take away the stress and the rod will return to its normal length and no harm has been done to it. This is very important if you're an engineer wanting to know the maximum loads you can safely operate uh, a machine you've designed uh, to work at over a long time because you really don't want to be realizing any permanent damage to the actual materials in your product. Now, as you take away uh, the strain uh, or the stress, your object will return to its original uh, size because all you're doing within your elastic regime and this initial linear regime of your stress strain curve as you're loading it up and moving upwards is you're simply uh, pulling on the intermolecular bonds slightly and they're just like little springs and so when you take away the load the strings simply relax back to their natural positions. Now, there's another term that we call the yield strength, and there has, there's a yield stress denoted sigma sub y. And this sigma sub y term is a value that occurs once you have already entered into something called the plastic or permanent uh, regime of this curve, and any load that you apply to your material be, uh, in this area is causing permanent damage to your material. And this damage is something referred to as necking. And so you may have seen videos of these uh, stress tests on metal rods, but basically at a time zero, you'd have your normal rod looking like this. And as more and more force is applied pulling on this rod, what we see is that you begin to get a little bit of a neck and uh, this neck right here has an area that is decreasing. And so going back to our definition 
of sigma, because area is in the denominator of sigma, if your area is getting smaller and smaller, your stress will continue to increase. And so um, we realize this in our stress strain curves by seeing this local maximum occur, which is referred to as your ultimate tensile strength. And so um, on an exam, typically you'll be asked, you'll be given a blank stress strain curve with just the function and they're going to ask you to find the yield strength or the um, yield stress of your material. And so the way you do that is by looking on the x-axis, the epsilon axis, for 0.2%, and then you simply draw a line parallel to the initial linear regime going upwards. And if I've drawn this correctly, it will intersect at your sigma y point right there. And then um, the other important quantity that you will be asked for is something referred to as the modulus of elasticity. And the modulus of elasticity is simply the slope of your uh, line in this elastic regime. So modulus of elasticity, which is called E, is equivalent to rise over run delta sigma over delta epsilon within this elastic region. So do not look at anything in this top region where this plot is beginning to bend. Um, we only care about the linear part. And then the final thing that happens to your material as you continue to apply uh, stress to it despite it necking is that we eventually realize fracture. So you, you'll talk about this a lot in failure uh, analysis classes. And what happens at fracture is the actual bonds holding the two halves of a metal rod together are completely broken and um, you no longer have a complete unit and there's no structural integrity uh, in your material anymore, so it's worthless. And so fracture is really bad. Um, and doing anything that exceeds your elastic limit is also very dangerous because if you're talking about years of life cycles on your product, um, it will uh, cause permanent damage and you're going to realize a lot shorter lifespan than what you're expecting. Okay, so now that we've understood stress strain curves, I'm going to work through an example problem. And so in this example, we looked up a tabulated value for a metal rod we were working with, and we found that it has a modulus of elasticity of 200 gigapascals, which is equal to 200 times 10 raised to the power 9 pascals. We also know that our rod has a normal length of 0 0.25 meters. And we also know just by measuring that its cross-sectional area of this cylinder is 1,250 square millimeters. And so the question that we are asking uh, here is that if we take our rod and we pull on it on both sides with a force of 5,000 newtons, what is its change in length? So as we apply more and more force to this rod, we'll see that it begins to extend slightly. And this extension um, in this diagram can be thought of as this delta L quantity, which I have exaggerated in this image slightly. And so L is this resting length of the rod before we've applied any stress to it. And so if you're confident, please pause this video and see if you can answer this on your own. And uh, what I'm going to do now is actually work through this problem. And so the very first thing we're going to be doing is looking back at our definitions of stress and strain. We're going to recall that um, the definition of epsilon was equivalent to delta L over your initial length. And so our goal here is to solve for delta L, which means that we will need to know what L times epsilon is equivalent to. 
And in these terms, I am using delta epsilon, um, but because I'm assuming that the rod was initially at rest with no stress applied to it, the initial strain is zero. So delta epsilon in this case is simply equal to epsilon. And so with these values, the next thing we're going to be doing is solving for um, or plugging in the terms that we actually know. So we know that our modulus of elasticity from another definition above was equal to sigma over epsilon. And we want to get epsilon because we don't know it yet. So epsilon is equivalent to sigma divided by E our modulus of elasticity. E is a material property that we already looked up, and sigma is something we're going to need to calculate. Sigma is equal to the force per area of our sample, and we know the force, that was 5,000 newtons, and the area is something that we're going to need to be careful with. We need to make sure that we stick with SI units, but we were given an area that has units of square millimeters. So area is equal to 1,250 square millimeters. And we know that there are 1,000 millimeters per meter. And we now square all these quantities to get the dimensions to agree. And so what we will find after this is that we get 1.25 times 10 to the minus 3 square meters is equivalent to the area that we have measured here. And so with this value of area, we can see that our uh, stress that we have applied to our sample is equivalent to four times 10 raised to the six pascals, which is equivalent to four megapascals. And with these values out of the way, what we can see is that epsilon is equal to four megapascals divided by 200 gigapascals. And an important thing I want you to take away from this is the fact that we have our dimensions here canceling each other. So we have pascals per pascal and dimensionless quantities are very important terms that you're going to deal with a lot uh, in your engineering courses. And it should make intuitive sense also because we'll recall that epsilon had units of delta L over L, which is equal to length per length. So it is also a dimensionless quantity. So these sanity checks are very important when you're working through these types of problems. Moving forward, what we're going to see here is that delta epsilon or epsilon is equivalent to 2.5 times 10 raised to the minus 5. And this is dimensional, so I'm not going to put any values here. And so now that we have our epsilon value, we are simply going to multiply it by the length of our rod. So we're going to have 2.5 times 10 raised to the minus 5. And then our rod had a length of 0 0.25 meters initially. And this will be equivalent to our change in length and this is equal to 5 times 10 raised to the minus 6 meters, which is equal to 5 micrometers. And so intuitively, what this tells us is that if I applied a force of 5,000 newtons onto this rod, pulling it uh, in opposite directions, we're expecting to see the rod become 5 micrometers longer. So that we are talking about a very small uh, elongation and um, that is going to be it for this video. I hope you guys find this useful and thanks for watching.